Now, it goes for four months now without any rain, with zero rain. When plants don't have water, they do what? I've tried to tell my wife this. Uh, she's got, some people have a green thumb. She's kind of like, I got a brown thumb. Every, every plant we have in our house is killed. You have to put water in them occasionally. We've got one right now that's dying, and I refuse to water it. I'm waiting to see how far she lets it go. It's going down. Anyway, so it's terrible. I, I did, anyways, okay, sorry, let's not get into that. But anyways, okay, four months of no rain. Now you say, how do plants live? What happens every morning, they get dew, okay? Because why? You've got, you guys are the Mediterranean Sea. The Mediterranean Sea comes off with this warm, moist air. The land, because the land's been all night, what's happened to the temperature? The temperature at night drops, the land is cool, the warm, moist air comes in off the, off the ocean, the Mediterranean Sea. When that warm, moist air hits the cool land, what does it do? It, condens it condenses on the land and causes dew. I've been out on the roads and the dew has been so thick that I've seen the dew go into storm sewers. In other words, it collects, it's just so thick and goes down. And that, from that dew then is how the plants survive. Okay, that's the, the little moisture they get. Now what types of plants do they raise for the fall then? Four months of nothing but sun. By the way, do grapes like sun? To be honest with you, what plant today does Israel grow that's like the best in the world? What, what kind of fruit likes like sun, like a lot of sun, solid sun, four or five months straight? Oranges. You get oranges the size of grapefruit over there, man, and they are like the best ever. I swear, I've never, anyways, I, I, just worth the trip just to have some oranges from Jaffa oranges. But anyway, sorry, but their, their oranges are phenomenal because it's been, you know, solid sun for like five months. So, but, but here they do grapes, grapes grow, and they, they do a lot of horticulture stuff with grapes, the tending of grape vines. By the way, will the grapes be a lot in scripture? Have we seen grapes produce what? Wine, uh, grape juice, that kind of stuff. We'll see a lot of grapes in scripture. Figs. Figs will be on these palm tree kind of things, and they'll have this big thing of figs about that. That way, I don't know. 40, 50 pounds, and there'll be all these little figs coming off. Figs are really sweet, and what they'll do to the figs is they'll mash them up and turn it into fig jam, like a, a jam or, well, yeah, a jam, okay? And they'll basically spread it on bread and things like that. So the figs are something that's really sweet, and they'll take it off these palm trees. They'll have these huge number of figs. They'll smash it up. They'll put the, 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 the fig tree, the, the sweetness of the thing, they'll put on baby's gums and stuff in the baby's mouth and stuff for sweet and things. So figs will be there. Olives, they do a lot with olives. The, the, the people over there eat a lot of olives. I can't stand olives, so I didn't make it too well. Um, olive oil, I, can, I love stuff cooked with olive oil and stuff. They'll do a lot. They'll crush the olives, make oil out of it, and olive oil will be one of their major products over there, olive oil. Whenever you see oil in scripture, it'll be referring to olive oil. This is a big staple for them. They will send it all around the world kind of thing, figs and grapes, okay? So those are all fall. This is when they harvest in the fall, usually September, October-ish, that kind of thing. In the fall, they'll have the Feast of Trumpets. This is called Rosh Hashanah. Rosh means head of the year. So the beginning of the year begins in September. They have a couple different ways that they figure their years. But the Feast of Trumpets. Now when I say trumpets, what's the problem? You think of a trumpet, you think of what? A brass trumpet with, you know, playing notes, da-da-da-da, that kind of thing, or taps or something. When they say trumpets, a shofar, when a shofar is a ram's horn. And so they'll have this ram's horn, comes out like this, and it'll kind of be a circle thing like this. They're about this big. They cost about 125 bucks for a little one. You get the big ones with the double swirls and stuff, they'll be like 250 and stuff. I couldn't even, you know, I played less for my cor cornet for when I was playing trumpet than that. But I mean, these, and then, by the way, on, the, on these ram's horn, do they have like little, you know, can you play a tune with the ram's horn? Everything's like, it'll be this brah sound, you know, kind of thing. It, it, it's not like a trumpet. You know what I'm saying? Like a trumpet, like you guys play, um, you know, uh, some sort of ode or something on your trumpet. This will be just, it'll be making this big rah sound out of coming out of this thing. And it'll just be a, a blowing of this ram's horn kind of thing. If you ever get to Israel and stuff, you want to get something cool, it's really good. I, I wish I had the money to get them, but they're very expensive. But these ram's horn, they still have them till this day. In the fall, starting of the year, 
bah, the, the, the trumpet will go off and they call that the, the Feast of the Trumpets, okay? It goes off, this is the start of the new year, okay? The Day of Atonement, this will be like a few days later in this, in this first month, a few days later, I think it's like 14 days later, you have Yom Kippur. Now Yom, you know Yom because we studied Genesis 1. Yom is what? Genesis 1, day, okay, it says day, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. This is the most sacred of all the Jewish feasts. This is the most sacred, the most holy. This is the one that, um, how should I say, quiet reflection on life, a very, very high holy day. Of all these, this is very somber, hot, where you're reflecting on your sins, that kind of thing. Um, now what actually happens in Yom Kippur, I think this is Leviticus 16, basically they have two, two goats, right? They bring the two goats up, and do you remember that they cast lots for the goat? And so one goat is set free, and the other goat is what? Sacrifice. Basically, they take the blood, they take the blood, so the blood from the one goat, that blood is then taken. Once a year, the blood goes into the mercy seat. And remember we had the Ark of the Covenant? The Ark of the Covenant was a box like this, and then on top of the box was the mercy seat with these cherubim with their wings touching over the top. Between the cherubim was called the mercy seat. And the blood once a year, they would take the blood of this goat that was selected, and they would put the blood on the mercy seat. Now, by the way, Josephus and some later guys tell us that they were Jews, the priests were scared because when you're in there, if the blood wasn't accepted, God could kill you on the spot. So what they did was they tied a rope around the priests so that the priests went into the Holy of Holies and, he, and God killed them, that all the other priests don't go in and try to drag them out and they all get killed too. So they tied a, a rope around them and with a bell on them and stuff. And then if the guy goes down, they just haul them out with the rope. Okay, anyways, that's later tradition and things like that. But th this is a high and holy day when they take the blood and put it on the mercy seat. By the way, what happens to the other goat? The other goat is set free. Do you see the imagery there? One goat dies and the blood is shed. The other goat goes free. And that goat is a scapegoat. You remember anything like scapegoat? Okay, so scapegoat gets set free, one dies for it. Can you see the idea of substitution there that would actually play in, with Jesus Christ, that one person dies, the other person goes free? So this is a high and holy day. By the way, if you're gonna attack the Jews, what's the day that you wanna attack them on? Has anybody ever heard of the Yom Kippur War? This is when they were attacked. Now, by the way, this is the most high and holy day. Would some Jews not fight on, even on this day? The problem is most Jews are secular. A lot of the Jews in Israel are secular. Question, will they fight? They will fight. And so what happened is then they got attacked. They attacked back and they blew them away and, um, and stuff. So, but they were attacked on their high, uh, their, on Yom Kippur. And that was, you know, just shows you some stuff. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles. What is that? The Feast of Tabernacles is when they have to go out and live in tents like they did for 40 years in the wilderness wandering. So the Feast of Tabernacles remembers the wilderness wandering when they were in the wilderness with God and the hardships, the hardships of the desert when they were out with tenting with God, moving from place to place. It's called Sukkot. The Sukkot is the name of these sukkahs. They have to build these tents and they have to live in these tents. Uh, when I was in Israel, um, Dr. Perry Phillips, the, the Elaine Phillips' husband and I, um, basically went down there because we wanted to go to Mea Sha'arim. Mea Sha'arim is, um, is where the real religious Jews, have you ever seen the real religious Jews with the black hats and the black curly cues? They're always walking around, Shema Yisrael, okay, they're bouncing like that. So well, we wanted to go down and see where the real Jews celebrated these sukkahs. We wanted to see how they built these tents, you know, and stuff. So we went down to Mea Sha'arim and we noticed there were all these women hanging on the outside bars of this one place and we heard this music. So we walk up and, and by the way, do the Jews separate men and women worship? Yeah, okay, so the women were not allowed in. And there was a room bigger than this room, and there's this guy up there wailing on the clarinet, and so he's wailing his music and stuff, and there's all about, I don't know, 200 guys in this room bouncing around with their hands on their shoulders and bouncing around and stuff. So Perry and I think, hey, you know, we're males, so it's okay and stuff, we're not Jewish and stuff, but by the way, you're not Jewish, do you have to wear a keep on your head then? So obviously, you look at me, I'm not Jewish. So man, we get a kippah, we put a kippah on our head. And so we go down in this thing. 
Well, what they don't tell you is that this is like a football game with no rules, man. These guys start coming up and they start bashing you in your ribs. You're going there like thinking this is a community thing. We're with them and stuff. All of a sudden, bam, you get hit and stuff. And they get bam, you get hit from the other side. Like I'm a pretty big boy and stuff like that. So you don't start bashing me like that and stuff. So anyways, we're getting whacked, but, but you have to get whacked to the music, see? And so every, <laughs> every time there's a beat, you're getting whacked. So we said, okay, I didn't whack anybody back, but I started protecting myself because it was getting hurtful and stuff. And th what I was really worried about was the hat on my head. Because question, if that hat come off, is there a problem? Yeah, you could get stomped to death. And I mean, I'm, I'm dead serious about that. that you could, and so I was like, oh, man. And so anyways, after we got whacked enough, it was like, it's time to get out of here. We've had enough of this. But it was just all dancing to music, man. But it was real physical. It was kind of like a male dance. You know, it was like a bash kind of thing. It was, it was Actually, it was really cool. Um, but it just, I, I just didn't feel appropriate whacking back. You know what I'm saying? You, you, anyways. Um, I, although I've been trained, I play football, so I could have done the flipper thing on him, but I just, I thought, yeah, all I need to do is do that, and then I'm going to have 10 guys on me. This isn't too good anymore. Why is it yeah. so bad if your yarmulke falls off? Well, if your yarmulke falls off, you're, you're supposed to be wearing a yarmulke, showing respect and things. If it comes off, then it's like you're not showing respect. Well, and, if it's just an yeah, um, these boys don't care about accidents. They care that the yarmulke is on your head. And what you should have had is you should have had a hairpin to, to clip it on your head, and that's how they keep it on. But I didn't have a hairpin, and so we were just, I was trying to, you know, trying to balance it on your head while you're getting whacked. It wasn't good. Uh, but the, anyways, okay, so we get out of there. So we get out of there, we come down the stairs and stuff. We go out, I want to see these sukkahs, right? You're going to build these tabernacles and stuff. So we go see how they build their tabernacles. This is how they build their tabernacles. They use four by eight sheets of plywood. And they build two sheets of plywood high, and they build two on one side, two on the other, two on the other, and basically they make themselves a little hut. And they put palm branches across the top. And so it's just a, a four by, you know, these four by eight sheets of plywood stuff. So I thought, man, I thought they were really going to do tents or something like that, and it's just this plywood stuff. Well, see, I was in electrical engineering, so I noticed electrical stuff. And so I look, and I look at the house there, and I said, stink, man, that's an electric cord coming out of there. It's going into that sukkah. I thought, what, what's, what's this electric cord going into a sukkah for? They're supposed to be roughing it out in the wilderness. So anyways, so I go up to this guy's sukkah, I poke my head in there to see, I just wanted to see, what, why is there an electric cord going into the sukkah? So I poke my head in there, and here is this dude sitting in a lazy boy chair watching television in his sukkah. And I'm thinking, yeah, Moses, you're out in the wilderness roughing it. And this guy's sitting in a lazy boy chair watching television. I just, it kind of took everything out of me. I thought, oh, anyways, okay. But, and and I'm, not saying, I'm not saying that everybody over there was watching television, okay? I'm sorry. The one guy that I looked at was watching television. I'm not saying they were all wired. Like they, they weren't all wired. I should say that. There was the one that was wired, and that's why I looked in there. But anyway, so Sukkah. So that's the Feast of Tabernacles, remembering the wanderers and wilderness. These are all in September-ish kinds of things. Now, one thing I should say, the Feast of Trumpets. Do many of these feasts have New Testament ramifications? Feast of Passover, Feast of Tabernacles. Somebody has once said that Jesus is going to come back on the Feast of Trumpets. This feast has never been fulfilled. We don't know what it really means. It's just they blow the trumpets and stuff. So people, remember when the trumpet sounds, Christ will descend? And so some people associate this Feast of Trumpets saying Jesus will come back in, what was it, 2010, when the trumpet sounds. Oh, 2010. This is 2011. Oh, I missed it. Anyways, uh, what's the problem with that? And, and actually... Is it possibly there is something with this Feast of Trumpets? Question, what did Jesus say? Does Jesus say explicitly, no one knows the what? The day or the hour. So what I'm saying is, I can't say that this Feast of Trumpets is, when somebody starts saying, you know, this is when Jesus is going to come back. We had that guy, what was it, in the spring? Does anybody remember follow that? In the spring, there was this whacked out guy that was saying Christ is coming back and what was it? Before graduation, just before graduation, man, don't take your finals, man. Why should you take your finals if Jesus is coming back, right? So anyways, this guy said that, and then it didn't work out like this, as always. I mean, this has been going on since, oh, man, I've been around since the 60s. I can remember this stuff. That's the, not the 18, but the 1960s and stuff. So anyways, it just, you know what I'm saying? So be careful. When anybody starts saying Jesus is going to come back and they use the Feast of Trumpets and stuff, should you put a big question mark by that? Get away. This is goofy stuff, okay? So, but, but there may be something to it. I don't know. 
but uh, and nobody knows. Jesus says no one knows the day or the hour, so just keep that in mind. But these are some of the fall feasts, okay? So spring feasts, wheat and barley harvest, fall feasts, grapes, figs, olives, these three feasts in the fall. Uh, did we just go through Yom Kippur? It was Yom Kippur just, a, what was it? Was it three, four weeks ago? Does anybody remember Yom Kippur? It just, it just was about three or four weeks ago um, that we went through that period. 